let's move on and get into some news in the United States. Uh, the COVID mandates, uh, mass mandates, uh, talking bad scene mandates, all this kind of stuff is getting ramped up. Uh, for a little bit, it seemed like, you know, maybe in the spring, uh, we had kind of worked against and maybe won some victory against vaccine passports uh, to the point where, you know, uh, well, especially last year, but even early this year, it was called conspiracy theory to say that these things were coming. But now more and more jobs are requiring it. The the state of New York, our city of New York City is requiring it. Uh, so let's yeah. just uh, I, we got tons of different mandates to get into here. But uh, start with mass. Yeah, sure. Um, so, like, there, there's quite a few things related to COVID in the last few weeks, I think, that are worth hitting on here. Um, we have touched, I think, on the whole Delta variant craze. Uh, I think we hit on that a couple shows ago. Um, and I had mentioned previously how all these places are bringing back sort of mass mandates and other restrictions because of this new COVID mutation. Um, this is also all being driven by this revised guidance from the CDC that they put out last month, where they kind of flip-flopped. They had previously said that people indoors uh, who are fully vaccinated don't need to be wearing masks. However, they flip-flopped last month and said that actually, no, we all have to be wearing masks inside again, even the fully vaccinated. And actually, uh, I'll get to this in a minute, but the definition of what fully vaccinated even means is about to change, or it is it has changed. Um, however, with the, the trend with the new mandates and the restrictions has definitely continued uh, uh, since uh, this, this whole Delta variant thing has kicked off. I honestly can't even keep up with all of the states and cities and counties that have reintroduced or tightened some of these rules. Uh, people watching the the video version, they can read that New Yorker or that New York Magazine piece. They do get into some of the localities because uh, it's on all different levels. It's you know state, city, and county, but they are popping up all over the place again. Um, all kinds of stuff in public schools now that's being debated, and as well as on the federal level. Um, and because the feds had previously not mandated very much throughout the pandemic, but since this whole Delta variant thing has kicked off, the feds are now doing quite a bit. Um, like, for example, there were, there's been a few smaller things. Um, like recently, the, the White House just extended this federal mass mandate for public transportation. Um, but the White House is also starting to do some fairly radical stuff. Um, it, like, it's definitely escalated even just in the last week. Because uh, last week they put out this announcement where they kind of listed, uh, you know, uh, three or four things they're going to be doing. And um, they're talking about now uh, uh, trying to do things on the federal level to overrule governors who try to ban mass mandates in their states. Like uh, Florida and Texas, I think, have uh, a few others have done that, uh, trying to just say that like businesses and, and schools and stuff can't can't mandate masks. However, the Biden administration is now saying that they're going to try to interfere with that in some way. Uh, they've been pretty vague about it, but I think they're talking about like doing things in courts uh, to try to interfere with these governors. Um, so that's pretty alarming that they're going to start trying to like impose themselves on the states. Um, they also previously had said that uh, all federal employees have to be vaccinated. However, as of last week, it's now all staff at nursing homes that participate in Medicare and Medicaid. And according to the White House, that comes out to like 15,000 facilities and 1.6 million workers. And so the number of people who are now federally mandated to get the jab, it is slowly growing. Like, you know, we have these 1.6 million uh, uh, workers at these nursing homes, as well as all federal employees. And I don't expect that to stop growing. I think that that population that is federally mandated will continue to grow. Right. Especially um, though, when we talked about the Pentagon already, which is, is it only active duty or is it everyone? Because that's like 3 million employees at the Pentagon. And so that's a that's another huge chunk of employees. Yeah, the, the last I had seen, they were talking specifically about active duty. However, uh, once this stuff gets FDA approval, I, I expect that to grow. And I will hit on that more. Um, and I did want to mention, too, that like they're they're pushing all these mandates and stuff, even though right now none of the three vaccines that are approved on an emergency basis in the U.S. have full FDA approval. So like they're they're moving ahead on this stuff before the FDA even really gives its green light. Um, now, all this mandate and restriction stuff, I think it is going to continue as long as the Delta variant is sort of being hyped. Uh, California, I know, just rolled out a statewide vaccine registry to track who's getting the shot. Uh, I don't think they've created like a mandate or a passport for the whole state yet. Uh, but that would seem to be sort of the logical next step after creating this registry. Uh, I know L.A. as a city is already talking or maybe it's L.A. County talking about doing a pass uh, just like New York City is about to do. And New York State also had some sort of like limited version of this, the Excelsior Pass. But I think this is all coming becoming more and more common, these kind of uh, uh, mandates and vaccine passes and all that kind of stuff. Um, so I think we can expect more of that now um, in terms of the vaccines themselves. Uh, they have been slowly trotting out this idea of booster shots, and that's becoming sort of like more and more uh, uh, the, a major story. Uh, the FDA initially authorized these for Pfizer and Moderna a few weeks ago, uh, but specifically that was for people with compromised immune systems. 
Uh, these were supposed to be two dose vaccines, uh, the Pfizer and Moderna shots. But now they were saying that these people in this vulnerable category may need another shot. Um, however, that is not all. Like that is now not stopping with the immunocompromised because last week uh, the FDA, the CDC, the Department of Health and Human Services, all the major health agencies came out with this joint statement saying that the COVID vaccines are losing effectiveness against the Delta variant. So they're now saying before it was just the immunocompromised. Now they say it's all adults who are, are going to need booster shots. Uh, the, so the FDA, the FDA hasn't even cleared that part yet either, like the universal third doses, let alone the vaccines themselves. But the White House is now already telling us this is a done deal. Uh, Biden made this big announcement last week saying that every fully vaccinated adult needs to get another shot within eight months of their uh, second dose. So that's what I meant when I said the definition of fully vaccinated is now changing. Previously, to be fully vaccinated meant having two shots. Now they're saying three shots is the full thing. But who knows at this point? Like the, the CEO of Pfizer, Albert Borla, has talked about the possibility of yearly booster shots from here on out. So, you know, like sort of like they do with the flu. And so I, this could like who knows where the logical endpoint of this all is of what it will mean to be fully vaccinated, you know, eight months from now. And of course, this is huge money for these big pharma firms, like just between Pfizer and Moderna, the two major producers in the U.S., they're expected to sell 50 billion dollars in vaccines this year alone. And that's not even accounting for all the, the, the booster shots they are about to start selling. Um, so there's a the media doesn't really talk about this too much, but there's a very clear financial incentive for these companies to be, you know, pushing this stuff to, to sort of, you know, I'm not necessarily saying they're doctoring their data, but to sort of make their data look like this is very necessary. Right. Um, uh, just just to put a number on it, Will, this is from sure. Reuters, right? So I'm going from mainstream sources right here. They say Pfizer and Moderna together expect roughly $50 billion of vaccine sales this year, assuming generously that half the people who receive two doses this year get an additional shot next year. If the price is the same, it's roughly an extra 25% in this year's revenue or $12.5 billion split between them. And so th this isn't like we're, we're not talking about a few million dollars here, Will. You know, th this is billions of dollars. This is the kind of money that people lie over. I'm not saying that yeah. people are lying. I'm just saying that when you put this kind of money in front of people, they tell lies. Yeah, like that is the way that incentives would go at the very least. Like, that's what I said, too. Like, I'm not I don't have any evidence that Pfizer has doctored its data or something, but they would certainly have the, the interest to make it to make this the best case they can for these booster shots. Um, and actually, the, the Pfizer, like the FDA has not even approved the, the third doses yet. Like they, they say they're looking at it. Pfizer only recently just sent in their initial trial data for this. But they're already saying that they think like, you know, the White House has already kind of moved ahead on this. Um, now, in terms of full FDA approval, uh, more recently, there have been some reports that the FDA is right about to give full authorization to the Pfizer shot. So that I think is very like it's very likely that that will happen soon, like within the next week or so is what these reports are saying. Because like I said, right now, all three vaccines that are used in the U.S., uh, Pfizer, Moderna, and Johnson & Johnson, they are only approved on an emergency basis only. Um, however, the full approval, I think, is very likely to bring all kinds of new mandates. You know, like we already have a bunch of hospital systems and universities saying that they will require vaccinations as soon as the FDA gives the green light. Uh, you mentioned the, uh, the, the U.S. military. It's at least active duty troops, uh, but it might be all the staff. And that certainly won't be all. I think there's a lot of like public and private bodies who will move ahead with these mandates. So unfortunately, I will think this will bring about a whole new wave of restrictions when they get the full uh, authorization. Um, now, I do have one more angle to hit on the COVID stuff, but I'll, if there's anything you wanted to mention, I'll let you jump in. No, go ahead. Okay, sure, sure. So uh, we now also have the national security state trying to label people who are skeptical about lockdowns and other you know, COVID mandates which, like I said, I think more are coming. They're trying to label these people as domestic terrorists and extremists. And, you know, we've kind of hit on this whole push uh, against so-called domestic extremism on the show a lot. And they did already kind of have this angle with the whole uh, Gretchen Whitmer uh, kidnapping plot, the, the Michigan, Michigan governor, which we'll have more to say about in a second here. But a big part of that story was that the guys were angry about Michigan's lockdowns. And that's what motivated this, uh, this so-called you know, kidnapping thing. So this connection has been made before. But earlier this month, the Department of Homeland Security put out this bulletin, this like security bulletin, explicitly warning that uh, people might start launching terrorist attacks in response to new like lockdowns and restrictions. And they're saying uh, that conspiracy theories and perceptions, quote unquote, of government restrictions are like fueling some terrorist threat. And I thought it was a pretty weird way for them to phrase it, saying perceptions of restrictions. 
like as if these aren't real, as if they're delusions or something, even though we've had some of the most draconian restrictions from our government officials in the last year and a half. But there's just perceptions of them is what's driving this. Um, but nonetheless, I think this domestic terrorism stuff is slowly being merged with like the COVID skepticism. And I do find that pretty alarming. Like it is an insanely Orwellian idea that opposing this stuff is what makes you extreme and radical. You know, like governments on every single level have grabbed insane, ridiculous amounts of power over the last year and a half. People being told they're not allowed to leave their homes or go to work. Like that is the extreme and radical thing, not being opposed to it. But of course, that's the way the DHS sees it. They see that there's a, a terrorist threat from people who are mad about these lockdowns and stuff. Yeah. Um, but I mean, they, they oh, go ahead. Uh, just that I just wanted to tie that in, especially with rhetoric you hear uh, from people against, you know, people who are unvaccinated. You know, people people who uh, are advocating bad scenes could get away with essentially saying everything they want. I heard somebody or somebody post on Twitter not that long ago, if everybody had gotten vaccinated, the pandemic would be over by now, which is, you know, a confusing statement when they're saying that you had to get a third, uh, you know, booster for the delta variant and it's less effective against the delta variant not to mention if you look at this this is a worldwide pandemic obviously and while there are a lot of people who have been vaccinated there's not a plan to have everybody vaccinated until 2023 and so it's not even feasible to say that everybody would be vaccinated by now there's just not that many vaccines or ability to get everybody the vaccines at this point so it's just completely untrue statements and then again uh the the very uh, are somewhat vaccine resistant and so then you have to at least you know, like acknowledge that oh man that might be a problem but no you could just say that and then the other thing is that uh, i think sean penn was the one who said that you know unvaccinated people are basically walking around and pointing a gun at everybody in this kind of rhetoric where you know they're, they're i think going to very he made the jump to anybody who's resisting at all to the regulations and restrictions and mandates are uh, potentially terrorists or who, you know, are like biological terrorists kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, man. And the logic of this stuff, it just cha- it jumps around so much because even with the booster shots, there's now like a cohort of ex- so-called experts and scientists saying that, like, you know, maybe the boosters aren't so necessary. I know CNBC ran this story where they were quoting all these people saying that, well, hey, people who get, like, breakthrough infections with the Delta variant, even when people who are fully vaccinated, hey, they only have mild symptoms, so it's really not that big of a deal. But, like, for the last, like, I don't know, eight months or something, we've been told that you have to get vaccinated not only to protect yourself, but to protect others. And so now suddenly for all these experts, oh, it's not that big of a deal if you're walking around with just mild symptoms. Whereas if you were unvaccinated with those same exact mild symptoms, they would say you're a dire threat. And so the logic just, it, it constantly shifts around. It's, they, they can never keep their argument still for more than like, you know, an hour or something. It just, it's, it's very, it seems very arbitrary. All right. Well, I got to ask you about this because you posted this fantastic article today and had a little thread yeah. on on Twitter. Uh, this is from New York Magazine. Uh, so yeah. before, you know, before anybody tries to report and get this video taken down, uh, we're signing a mainstream source here. Yeah. The science of masking kids at school remains uncertain. So what uh, was it saying in this article? Yeah, so this this is a, a very fascinating story where the guy kind of just goes and runs through a lot of like the science and studies that have been cited by the CDC itself to sort of justify why uh, children you know should be wearing masks in schools, and uh, he went through like the CDC's latest guidance on this, and I think there were 17 studies. They had a bunch of different references, but not all of them were about like masking and stuff. But he he pulled out the I think the major 17 studies they're citing uh, to you know to justify masking in schools. And he found that these studies, they don't even have control groups. And they're just lumping in all these different mitigation measures and just assuming that masking is the one that's helping. And so like ventilation was a very big one that like, they're basically not like separating their variables. Cause like, you know, they're gathering data. Ventilation might actually be the thing that's improving their outcomes, but they're just coming out and citing these studies and saying, look, this shows that masking works. And really in study after study and over a dozen of them, that's actually not what's, what's being proven at all. And so people always say, like, oh, you got to follow the science and look at the CDC has all these studies. But not all studies are created equal. Like, if you don't have a control group to con- you know, compare to, then how can you really draw, like, definitive conclusions from a lot of this? And this New York Magazine piece, it goes through and he cites a bunch of other experts who've also reviewed some of the literature. And they're saying that, like, we can't really find any definitive studies that show, like, a clear benefit of masking in schools. And he, there's a lot of other interesting sort of considerations about how, you know, children, uh, there's, there's like a saying apparently among pediatricians that children are not just little adults. 
Like there are some weird things medically that like we might not even fully understand right now, but kids aren't just the exact same as just adults, but smaller, like they, their immune systems work slightly differently. And so, you know, certain things that might work for adults, maybe there are some studies that show that, you know, masking has helped uh, with adults that doesn't necessarily apply to children. And so there's just a lot of different variables and considerations here. And I think a lot of people often sim oversimplify this stuff when they just say, trust the science or follow the science. Well, when you start looking at some of the science and studies that have been cited, it doesn't really seem to support the position they're, they're saying it does. Right. Well, and it's also interesting, Will, that uh, when we talk about mitigation measures, especially when, when something like school and like kids development and, you know, we're now going on like 18 months of them, like having limited social contact and wearing masks and everything. Uh, yeah. the, you know, it, it's it's interesting that we're not talking about like numbers here and they're saying like, you know, we could reduce transmissions by 4 percent. But what does that mean for kids? You know, I just throw numbers out there. Right. But you, there, there isn't anything concrete. It's just like mass work. So we have to use them. That's that's right. as far as they go in their uh, analysis of all this. And no, there are other variables to life and other things to talk about, especially when you're talking about children. And so uh, it's interesting that there's all the these problems with the mass, especially the, the science around uh, schools will. But to have. Um, I guess, you know, not even like a good study to like base the conversation on and to really, you know, break down what what would be best for the, you know, the kids, which I think should probably be the number one priority in schools. Like, you know, sorry if you're a teacher. I worked in a school before. I worked in a school where teachers took punches. They got spit on. It's part of being a, a teacher. You know, what I mean, like kids are developing right. uh, when you develop. You're not you know, you got to learn and you got to learn by doing things wrong. And so um, there's there's some risk to being a teacher and uh, catching COVID is, you know, one of those things. Hell, anybody who works in school knows that you're probably going to get a pretty nasty uh, version of the flu every year or two. And that's right. uh, that's just part of doing it. And so it's very interesting, again, that there's no conversation around what's best for the students here, even if they, they could prove that the, you know, masks were effective, which at least uh, by this uh, article in the New York Magazine, Will, it seems to say not that masks don't work or anything like that just that the the studies don't show that they do right right yeah exactly that, that article doesn't prove that masks don't work it's pointing out that the the evidence being cited to say they do is not what the people who are citing it say it is um and you know it's kind of weird uh, my colleague at rt riley wagaman did a, a pretty good write-up where he went over and like did a timeline of the cdc's stances on masks like including well before covid back in like 2008 or something and there had been some studies on this, and the general consensus was that, like, nah, this really isn't, like, you know, no, there's not much benefit to speak of here. And indeed, when COVID first kicked off, that's what every major health agency was saying. That was the collective wisdom. That's what it. Dr. Fauci that, like, said. Exactly. That's what Deborah Burke said. That's what the Surgeon General said. That's what the World Health Organization said. Everyone said, you know, don't, like, go crazy about masks. Like, they're, they're more likely to give you a false sense of security than they are to protect you. And that, like, maybe N95 masks can help you, particularly in a healthcare setting. But, you know, we need to save those for our healthcare workers and all this stuff. That was sort of the, the logic. But, yeah, like, the just to see how radically the, the narrative about masks has changed is very bizarre. It seems there's more than just, you know, new scientific studies driving this. I think there's some weird political stuff that, that gets wrapped into this. So, well, I just had a couple uh, additional like mandates and stuff I want to hit on before we move on. Uh, California sure. schools are going to be the first to require that all staff uh, have the, the vaccination. And so I, I was interested in this because, you know, when people think of staff, they always think teachers and that's definitely true. But this also means like all the janitors and lunch ladies and, and uh, coaches and stuff like that too. And, uh, those bus drivers and those positions aren't always easy for districts to fill. And so I'm wondering if, if, you know, you start to limit the number of people who could work at your, uh, school by who's willing to get the vaccine or not, you know, you could be really digging into the, like the number of people you have willing to work. I want that. I, I mean, I know a lot of times schools uh, are really struggling to get, especially anybody decent, but even just bodies in the building to be teachers you know people with degrees and stuff like that um right. and then you know interesting with that will is if a teacher didn't want to be vaccinated uh you know going by you know who's at risk the older you are the more at risk you are well the teacher's always you know and 
a public school saying gonna be older than the student and so what if a teacher doesn't want to get vaccinated exactly you know what what what's the risk and i want i'm interested in what exactly the logic is behind this other than the government just having the influence to be able to force another group of people to get vaccinated uh right. the new york stock exchange is requiring requiring vaccination to have access to the trading floor you won't even be able to go down there with like a mask and a negative pcr test and so i'm wow. seeing more and more places move towards this well where it seems like uh for something like the new york stock exchange or like to attend the uh scott horton build crystal soho forum debate in new york city like this would be something that as long as you could show negative p, p uh, pcr test and uh you, you know you're not symptomatic at the time that they would you know let you in or something like that and that's uh that apparently isn't an option in an increasing number of places now the last story yeah. i had on uh vaccin vaccination or covid was uh rand paul's suspension uh suspension from uh yahoo where you know he talks about masking and i i think a lot of people who have uh stood up for rand paul and his you know uh what should be youtube allowing him to you know post his opinions on there um you know maybe he overstated the uh effect or the the lack of effectiveness of mask i don't know right like right. you you could get into that but anyways uh in this particular case youtube felt like he did and then they took his video down and suspended him for a week it being his second warning uh me and will actually have a warning on our account for some crap that youtube never bothered to look at or appeal on even though it was three months ago so if you know we do catch a flag on this you won't be able to see us post on youtube for a whole week so definitely uh subscribe to the show at rumble or odyssey if you love the video version of it but anyways well Rand Paul has uh, taken down suspended and it's absolutely ridiculous that it happened but I can't help but notice that just what a week ago uh, or before this Rand Paul was saying that I call on those who dread hatred and anger towards our police uh, that there will be consequences to words and actions directed against law enforcement and so you know when he gets suspended from Twitter then it's a free speech issue but he's uh, you know calling for there to be legislation against people saying mean words to cops Cops, which is absolutely right. absurd so of course you know Rand Paul always has to have the part of his uh whatever he's got going on but it is unfortunate that he was suspended from uh YouTube and that, you know that's ridiculous 